Thank you. 
part of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for you. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll read 13 to 22. It says, If there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we who are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he didn't raise him if in fact the dead aren't raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. What hope we have through the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to gather here this morning. The disciples mourned on Friday. They were mourning on Saturday as they grieved your loss. But their mourning and their grief, their sadness turned to joy. That Sunday morning, when they realized that the tomb was empty, because death couldn't hold you. The grave couldn't keep you. We too rejoice this morning as we reflect on your resurrection from the dead. And as we realize that there is hope in Jesus as Savior, there is hope and assurance and the promise of everlasting life because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. We thank you for your everlasting love. So Lord, we're here this morning to give you all praise and honor and glory. We commit ourselves and we commit this time completely to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give you a couple announcements very briefly. Don't forget your giving plan. Thank you to everyone who has given. We here at Fardale Trinity Church, we rely on your giving. It's essential to the ministry here, and it's essential to our missionaries around the world who rely on our support, who are faithfully doing God's work. Just a quick reminder that we ask that during this time uh, that you wouldn't give cash, uh, but we've given you a couple opportunities to give in a number of different ways. If you go to our homepage on our website, fardeltrinitychurch.org, you could click the donate button and pay through PayPal. You could also uh, mail your tithe directly to the church, or you could drop off your tithe to the church as well. So you could give in a number of different ways. Thank you to your faithfulness to give it. And we pray that you would continue to remain faithful to it. Uh, I continue to mention that if anyone needs anything, please reach out, email me. You can call me at any time, and I'm here available to pray with you, to uh, talk with you, to help you through whatever struggles you're having. So don't hesitate to reach out. I also encourage you to please check your emails daily because I will send daily emails to you as a way of encouragement to remind you of what Scripture says and to encourage you through Scripture to provide that comfort from God's Word. I'll send a weekly devotional on Wednesdays. We'll send a bulletin and the sermon discussion questions later on in the week. So continue to check your emails throughout the week. That's a way for me to continue to stay in touch with you. Uh, also, something new is that next Sunday, William Tantum will be teaching Sunday school through Zoom. And that, again, that begins next Sunday at 9 a.m. So I'm going to send you an email during the week with a link to that Zoom Sunday school class. And I want you to stay tuned and, and ready for that. A couple other quick announcements before we roll into the sermon and special music. Or that we want to remind everybody here at FTC that our pastor search has been underway. I thank the, the 10 men and women from our congregation who are faithfully serving the Lord in this way, that even through these difficult times, 
they've carried on with God's work in a search for a new pastor. They've done a lot at this point. As you can see it up on the screen, they're studying the book of Titus together. They've put together a church profile. They've uh, looked into seminaries and websites for posting. They've come up with interview questions. A job description is almost done. We're going to put uh, various things on our church website as well. And they anticipate that the target date for posting the job will be June 1st. So please continue to lift up the search committee in prayer. One of them would have loved to be here to give this announcement to the entire congregation in person, but we know that we're limited in doing that. So I give the announcement to you on their behalf. Thank them whenever you can and continue to pray for them and the work that they continue to do. One last announcement again is that next Sunday will begin Sunday school class. It will go from next Sunday to June 7th. It will be from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Zoom. Again, I'll send the link to you guys during the week. And uh, it will be all about the prophecies about the Messiah, looking at uh, various Old Testament prophecies. So what a wonderful class and what a timely message for us to all listen to and, and having that opportunity to fellowship with one another. At this point, I'm going to ask Janine to come back up and uh, she's going to sing a special music number.
have the uh, minute blast going, and the sloth had one minute to draw what was given to him on that card. This is actually a Geico commercial, and to me it's a hysterical commercial, partly because his teammates get so frustrated at him because he's taking forever to draw this one line. It takes the entire time for him to draw the line, and it's great because you can hear in the background his teammates trying to guess what that line is gonna become. So they give their guesses, they say, line, um, pen, pencil, stick, and I love this one. One of them says, coin slot. There was no way, see if I were to ask you, what would this line turn into? You'd have no idea because it would take forever for this small to draw it. And if you were on this small team trying to figure out what this would become, you'd get frustrated just like his teammates in the commercial because it would take forever to figure out that that line would ultimately become a tandem bicycle. Looking at that line right there, there's absolutely no way you'd be able to tell that that line was going to become a tandem bicycle. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, what in the world does this have to do with church? What in the world does this have to do with Christianity? What in the world does this have to do with Resurrection Sunday? So what I want to do is now put a couple images on the screen for you, and I hope you could see them. If I were to put this image up on the screen, I think most of you would be able to tell me what it is. It's an image that you see during Christmas time, throughout the Christmas season, on Christmas Eve, and on Christmas Day, you would see an image like this, something representing the manger scene. And really what that does is it signifies Christ's birth. Now, if I were to ask Mary and Joseph and the shepherds who were there that day, do you know fully what his birth would ultimately lead to? I don't know that they'd be able to tell us. They wouldn't be able to tell us. Just like those who were on this lost team wouldn't be able to tell that that was going to become a tandem bicycle. What if we were to ask Jesus' disciples, while Jesus taught them, and as, as Jesus uh, displayed miracles, and as Jesus lived with them and did ministry with them, if we were to ask Jesus' disciples, disciples, do you know what his life and ministry will ultimately lead to? Based on what Scripture says, I don't know that they'd be able to answer that question, even though Jesus taught them very clearly that he would suffer at the hands of sinful men, that he would die and rise from the dead. So ultimately, his birth would lead to this. We just reflected on Christ's death on the cross for us. His sacrifice on our behalf just this past Friday. Even then, as some of his disciples were there watching what was unfolding, would they know what this, the cross, his death, would ultimately lead to? Even then, they forgot. But it would ultimately lead to the empty tomb. Death couldn't hold him. Death couldn't keep him. The grave couldn't keep him. He won victory over sin, over death, and the grave. So ultimately, his birth, his life, his ministry, his death would lead to the empty tomb, his resurrection. And today, he stands at the right hand of the Father as our advocate, our mediator, between us and God. He's the one who pleads our case before the Father when we turn to Him in repentance and faith. This is what I want to talk about this morning. I want to help you understand Easter, Resurrection Sunday, the best that you can. At youth group, what we're doing throughout this school year is we're focusing on this theme of owning our faith, helping the kids own their faith. It's so important for mom and dad to be that central part of a child's faith when they're growing up, right? That mom and dad would lead them in the instruction of the Lord. But there comes a point in a teenager's faith that they need to own that on their own. They need to own it. It needs to be their own faith. It's no longer mommy and daddy's faith. It needs to be their own. So what we've been doing at youth group throughout the school year is answering difficult questions from Scripture. 
so that they could understand the Christian faith a little better, that they could really make it their own. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to answer a couple questions for you. I want to look at initially three questions. Why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to rise from the dead? And why should this be so important to me? So let's look at that first question. Why did Jesus have to die? It's almost like a rewind back to Good Friday. But that's okay because it sets us up for answering that question then of why he needed to rise from the dead. So that first question, why did Jesus have to die? We could answer that question in a couple different ways. First, because sin caused death and separation from God. The result of sin was death and separation. And that's what God warned Adam and Eve right there in the garden. We see it in Genesis 2, 16-17. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. God loved Adam and Eve so much that he planted them in paradise on earth with every good thing. You rewind. Scripture lets us know in the book of Genesis, right at the very beginning, that God spoke everything into existence. When there was nothing, God spoke everything into being. But we see God's special hand upon his creation of man. Scripture lets us know that he formed man from the dust of the ground. It's like God's special hand was upon mankind. He formed man from the dust of the ground and he breathed his own breath in their nostrils. God had a special purpose for mankind as well, that they would reflect him and bring him glory in everything they do. So God planted Adam and Eve in the garden with every good thing so that they would prosper. In fact, what we see in Scripture is that it was perfect for a time. The way that God intended for it to be. Adam and Eve were in perfect relationship with God. God's presence was with man. Adam and Eve were in perfect harmony, at peace with one another. And they were in perfect relationship with God's creation. It was perfect. Exactly the way that God intended. God warned them, when you eat of this tree, you will surely die. And what we see, sadly, in Genesis chapter 3 is that Adam and Eve fell into temptation and they willfully disobeyed God's command. It wasn't just disobedience to God's command. It was rejection of God's authority and lordship over their life. In a way, they were declaring themselves to be in control. I am my Lord. I am my authority. I'm going to make my own decisions. I'm going to defy what he has said. They willfully disobeyed. And as a result of their disobedience and rejection of God, he banished them from his presence and he banished them from the garden. They were cast out of his presence. And what we see in Scripture, specifically in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, that we incurred their sin. Their sin affected all mankind after them. Here's what the Bible says in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Sin affected all mankind. You know, it's, it is a sad story because God intended for Adam and Eve to reflect him perfectly and to bring him glory. But you see the image of God begin to deteriorate in man as time goes on. That almost immediately in Genesis chapter 4, we see the first murder. Their sin affected all mankind after them. So why did Jesus have to die? Because the result of sin was death and separation. Therefore, the payment for sin was death as well. And that's what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 59 too. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. 
And then we know what Romans chapter 6 says. The Apostle Paul says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So sin brought about death and separation for God from God. So the payment for that sin needed to be death as well. But God has always allowed a substitute for His people. And we see that in the Old Testament sacrificial system. That Old Testament sacrificial system wasn't just for the people of Israel, period, bottom line, end of story. No, the Old Testament sacrificial system would, would foreshadow what Christ Jesus would ultimately do for us once for all. Part of the Old Testament sacrificial system was this. We see it in Leviticus 1.4. It was commanded, you are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. So what would happen is once a year, the high priest would offer a lamb sacrifice, year old perfect, without blemish and without defect. And he would sacrifice that lamb and he would lay his hands on the lamb and in a way, he would transfer his own sin and the sins of the people onto the Lamb so that the sins of the people would be atoned for. But all of that was to foreshadow what Christ Jesus would do for us. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So out of love for his people, God provided a substitute. In a way, God provided a way out. The people of Israel couldn't be made right from their sin on their own, so God set up this Old Testament sacrificial system whereby their sins would be forgiven and atoned for. And all of that pointed to Christ Jesus and what He would do for us once for all. The prophets prophesied about his substitutionary death. One of the passages we read here on Good Friday was from Isaiah chapter 53. And the prophet Isaiah says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on Him. By His wounds we are healed. He took our place in death as our substitute. That's what the prophet Isaiah pointed to. We know what a substitute is like because we've been in school before. If your teacher was ever sick, they would call in a sub. And the sub would come in to take over for the teacher. Now over the past, what, month? Moms have kind of been like the substitute teacher in your classroom. You know what a substitute is like. The substitute takes the place of the other person. Jesus took our place in death. Jesus came as a lamb to die for our sin once for all. That's what John the Baptist saw in Jesus. That's what John the Baptist knew in Jesus. As he saw Jesus walking by in John 1.29, John the Baptist declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that Old Testament sacrificial system would ultimately point to Jesus, our perfect sacrifice who would lay down His life on our behalf. And His sacrifice was the only one good enough in the sight of God to satisfy God's wrath. You see, Jesus came from His place in heaven. He was fully God. He came from His place in heaven. That's what the Apostle Paul points out in Philippians chapter 2. He didn't consider equality with God something to cling to or hold on to, yet He lowered Himself and became nothing. He came to earth and was obedient to the Father's will. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus was fully God and fully man. His sacrifice was of infinite worth and infinite value. His sacrifice was greater than the sin. And it was of infinite value because He was God. You see, the sacrifice needed to represent 
the offender, man, in order to satisfy the one who was offended, God. And it did both. Because he was fully man, he was able to represent man before God. Because he was fully God, his sacrifice alone was sufficient enough to satisfy God's wrath against man once for all. Here's what John says in John, uh, 1 John 4.10. This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. To say that He was the atoning sacrifice would mean that He made propitiation. For some of you who have no idea what atoning sacrifice means, now that I've said He's made propitiation, you especially don't know what I mean. But what that means is that His sacrifice was good enough to satisfy God's wrath once for all time. Why did Jesus have to die? Because the result of sin was death and separation. And the payment for sin is death. And because God allows a substitute. And our substitute was His Son, Jesus Christ. So the second question I ask is, why did Jesus have to rise from the dead? So that kind of clears up and settles Good Friday, but now why did Jesus have to rise from the dead as we focus on Resurrection Sunday? Well, to demonstrate that God did, in fact, accept Jesus' sacrifice. Well, we know that Jesus' sacrifice as a perfect God-man was sufficient enough in God's eyes to satisfy God's wrath against man, but the resurrection demonstrated that God, in fact, did accept the sacrifice of His Son. We see passages like these in the beginning of Acts. Acts chapter 2 here. Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 5. I want to read this one for you. It's Acts chapter 2, 22 to 24. It says, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. The resurrection was a demonstration that God accepted the sacrifice of his son. The resurrection was there to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. I love this passage because after Jesus rose from the dead, His disciples, for a couple days there, they were in mourning, they were grieving, they were sad, they were downhearted, it says in Luke chapter 24. Two of His disciples were on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus pulled up and walked right alongside them, but they were kept from recognizing Him. They began to explain to Jesus... Everything that happened to Jesus a couple days prior. And at one point, here's what Jesus said. It says that He said to these disciples, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And then He opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You know what happened as a result? They were comforted, and they were encouraged because Jesus pointed them back to the truth of Scripture and what the prophets had foretold. So the resurrection was to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. Why did he need to rise from the dead? To validate his own claims. So we know that it was a demonstration that God accepted the sacrifice of his son. But Jesus also made the claims that he would suffer at the hands of sinful men and then rise on the third day. So the resurrection was to validate his own claims. All throughout the Gospels, were the accounts of Jesus teaching His disciples again that He would die, but that He would rise again on the third day. Here are just a couple. Mark 8.31 He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. 
and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Here's another one. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Again, the Gospels are filled with Jesus' claims that he would suffer and rise again. Lastly, why is the resurrection, why is the resurrection of Jesus needed to prove his victory over sin and death? Here's what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that has been written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Yes, Jesus died. But He didn't stay dead. He didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the grave and proved His victory over sin and death. So that might for you be a better understanding of what the resurrection is all about. But then we have to ask the question, well, why is this important to me or why should this be important to me? And these are very important questions to ask. It should be important to me because when I turn to Jesus as my Savior, deliverer from sin's power and penalty, because He died and rose for me, I can live forgiven and cleansed from sin's power and penalty over my life. I can live forgiven. You know what the beautiful thing of this forgiveness is that He doesn't require anything of us. His offer of salvation is available to all who would believe on Him. Just like we focused on that one criminal who said to Him in His last moments, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus declared, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus didn't require anything of that man. The offer of salvation is available to all who would believe on Him. The Bible says that when we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what the amazing thing is? Through His death on the cross, He, he did away with our sin problem. That when we trust in Him, we've been forgiven. That sin problem no longer stands and we're no longer separated from God. We're declared right in His sight through faith in Jesus. But what is also removed is that feeling of guilt and shame and sorrow over sins that we've committed in the past. We don't have to feel guilty. We don't have to feel ashamed over past sins. Because we know that He's cast our sin as far as the east is from the, the west. He doesn't look upon our sin any longer. Our sin is removed. Here's what Acts 13.38 says, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. His death and resurrection are important because by trusting Jesus as Savior and because of what He's done for us, we can live forgiven and cleansed from sin. Because of what He's done for us, we could live now as part of God's family, united with brothers and sisters in Christ through faith in Jesus. Yes, when we turn to Jesus as Savior, He's our Father, but we have other brothers and sisters in Christ that we are united to in faith. And that's what Paul says in Romans 8. The spirit you receive doesn't make you slaves so that you will live in fear all over again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children and we're part of God's family united to one another in faith in Jesus Christ. I love this one. Because of what He's done for us, we can live with Jesus as a foundation for our lives. Regardless of what we're going through, regardless of how good and pleasant things in life might be, regardless of how difficult and trying things in this life might be, 
If you've turned to Jesus as your Savior, we could live with Him as the foundation for our lives and the anchor for our soul. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 7, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat up against that house, yet it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock, the Word of God. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat up against that house and it fell with a great crash. The same difficulty, the same trouble came upon both people. But the one who had Christ Jesus at his, as his firm foundation stood firm. We can stand firm in Christ Jesus. Did you know that we could stand firm together as well? Although we're apart, we're still united through faith in our Lord and Savior. We stand firm together, and when we're together, we're stronger. We can live with Christ Jesus as a foundation for our lives. We can live with His presence in this life. Because of what He's done for us, And by trusting in Him as Savior, we could live with His presence in this life. Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. The writer of Hebrews says, uh, never will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. That's a promise that God gives His children. He promises to be with us, to go before us, to guide us and lead us. He says, abide in me and I will abide in you. Mary found comfort in the presence of her Savior. We too can find comfort and peace in the presence of our Savior. That's why I've encouraged you so much during this difficult time to continue to remain devoted to your relationship with the Lord Jesus in prayer and in His Word. We could live with His presence in this life and that gives us peace. Peace that transcends all understanding which guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. But we could live with His presence not just here in this life. We will live with His presence forever. The Lord Jesus is coming again one day and He's coming to make all things new. When He establishes the new heavens and the new earth, we read in the book of Revelation that He will be our God and we will be His people. We will dwell in His presence forever. Because of what Christ Jesus has done for us through His death and resurrection, I can experience victory over my sin struggle. That doesn't mean and it doesn't say I will no longer sin It doesn't mean I won't struggle with sin anymore. It means though that when I give myself fully to Him, I can gain victory through the work that He's done on my behalf. See, the Apostle Paul took a lot of Romans chapter 7 explaining his own struggle with sin. And he comes to the conclusion at the end of Romans 7 by saying, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to sin and death. But then he declares, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. We too can experience victory over our struggle with sin. Lastly, his resurrection guarantees my victory over death and the grave. Victory over death and the grave that I know because Christ Jesus rose from the dead, I too will rise to new life one day. The resurrection guarantees victory over death and the grave for all who trust in Him. In John 11, we read that one of Jesus' good friends, Lazarus, died. And it took Jesus a while to get to the place where Lazarus died died where he was buried. Martha ran up to Jesus upon seeing him from a distance and said to Jesus, if only you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus was filled with sadness over the loss of his friends. 
over the loss of his friend. Jesus said, though, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? So we ask the question, now that we've talked about Good Friday, we've talked about Easter Sunday, where does that leave you? Where does that leave me? Well, did you notice how Jesus ended with a question to Martha? Do you believe this? So as we ask that question, now what and where does this leave me? I ask you that same question that Jesus asked Martha. Do you believe this? So, okay, I'm up here presenting all of this to you based on the truth of Scripture, but do you believe this? Here's another question or another series of questions. Do you want this forgiveness? Do you want His presence in your life, victory over sin in the grave? The Bible says that it's available to all who believe in Him, but I want to point this out. It's not enough to simply know these facts up here in your mind. It's not enough just to know these intellectually. What is enough is this, to believe in, to have faith in Jesus, trusting Him as Savior and the work that He did on the cross to redeem you. So faith. Part of faith is asserting to the facts. But what we're talking about here is saving faith. And saving faith has content. And the content of our saving faith is found in the gospel. And the gospel presented clearly says that we all have a problem. And that problem is sin, which separates us from God. We looked at the passage. For the wages of sin is death. That separation from God. And we are so stained in our sin that there's nothing we could do on our own to get that problem right. We're not good enough. We can't earn it and we don't deserve it. We have a problem. And that problem separates us from God. But here's the good news of the gospel message that God loves us so much that He provided the the solution to the problem. And that problem was, the solution was through His Son Jesus who would die as our sacrificial lamb, as he would take our place in death and die a death that we deserved so that we could have everlasting life in him. So you come to a recognition and an understanding of this truth. And in response, you turn to him as the source of your salvation or deliverance. He's the object of your faith, faith, the one that you're placing your faith in. He's the only one who could forgive and trusting that His work on the cross was good enough to forgive you. If you've come to a place today, right now, where this is making sense, where you've come to such a conviction of your sin problem and your guilt, why don't you pray with me in a prayer to trust Jesus as your Savior. Right here in the quietness of your heart, why don't you pray with me? Let's pray. Father, for the first time, I'm in agreement with what you say. I understand that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I know that my sin separates me from You and there is nothing I could do to get right with You. I've tried and tried and tried, yet I have failed because there's nothing good in me apart from You to get to You. I thank You that Jesus died on my behalf, that He took my place in death, that He died on the cross for me and rose from the grave declaring victory over sin and death. And now, Lord, here in this moment, I turn to You. I trust You as my Savior. 
the only one who could deliver me from my sin. I trust and I know that your work on the cross was good enough to forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what I want to do is, before I leave you, we still go back to this question of, now what? For those of you who have placed your faith in Jesus as your Savior, there's a message for you as well. Here are some action points for you. If you've done this, I so strongly encourage you to live with confidence, to live with the hope of eternity always on your heart and mind, to always fix your gaze on the Lord Jesus Christ, and to never forget or take for granted what He's done for you. Because of what He's done for you, we can live with confidence, standing firm in Him, no matter how difficult life might be. He hasn't given us a spirit of fear all over again, but a spirit of confidence and strength, not in ourselves, not in our current circumstances, but in Him. Here are a couple more action points. Action point one, yes, live with confidence in the hope of eternity, always on your heart and mind. But because of what Christ Jesus has done for you, action point number two, worship Him with all of your heart. Their mourning turned to rejoicing. We can praise God even in the midst of our difficulty because we know and trust that God is in control. And we know and we trust that God can and God will do great things. He will deliver us from this. So we worship Him with all of our heart. Action point number three. Serve Him with all of your strength. Yes, we're limited as far as what we could do in serving Him. But did you know that God has placed people in your life, right in your own home, that you could serve with all of your heart? Focus on your family and how you could love them and treat them with kindness and gentleness, love and respect as you're around them every day. And if God provides an opportunity for you to serve someone outside your home, do it. Serve Him with all of your strength. The last action point is this. To tell others about Him as if today were their last. We don't know the hour of our Lord's return. So if God opens a door and provides an opportunity for you to tell others about Him, take hold of that opportunity. Proclaim Him. And proclaim the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for every day that you've given us. We don't just rejoice today. We rejoice every day. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. May that be our heart. May that be our attitude because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. Father, we love you. We thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed rest of the week. We'll see you next Sunday.